Once again, I want to thank you very much for being with us on our Friday's Fighters. I have yet another friend of mine, of mine here with me today, Brother Sorrell Wesson. Uh, he is a man who's met with some special trials in life throughout times. At one point in time in his life, for a good while, as a matter of fact, he was a gun dealer, fully licensed and uh, legal in all that he did. But because he had just basically committed a few oversights throughout the years and the way that he sold guns to individuals and such, eventually uh, he was prosecuted for that, eventually spent some time in prison for it. But the beauty of his story, as you'll see, I think, toward the end of this, is that in spite of him being in prison, uh, somewhat wrongly on some of these charges at least, but nonetheless he was able to come through and fight the good fight of faith. He stood like the Apostle Paul did in prison and was able to affect the lives of many, cause many to want to obey the gospel and baptize many as he went throughout his time there. And so he met with some success on behalf of God because of God's providence. And so I just want to introduce you to him. And, and if you would, Brother Sorrell, if you would begin by telling us what exactly uh, put you in prison to begin with. What were you trying to do and what mistakes did you make? Well, Jim, like you said, I had a federal firearms license and I never advertised selling guns. I had a store in Anderson in the chemical business. And the only reason I got a federal firearms license in the 90s sometimes was because I grew up and I had guns all the time. Occasionally I would buy a gun. And, and so a guy that worked with me, Eddie Lee, he told me one day, he said, why don't you just get your federal firearms license? said, you'll save money. So that's the reason I got one. And I didn't advertise selling guns to anybody. I got it personally for myself. But a few friends of mine, they, they found out about that. I didn't have anything on the store windows or anything else, gun dealer or anything like that. But anyway, some of my friends bought some guns from time to time. And as a result of one particular, this was in 01, 2001, I sold a 380 revolver to a friend of mine, I thought, but nonetheless, he got in trouble, or he was in trouble at that time, and I didn't know, but nonetheless, it's my fault. I didn't do a background check on him, and I should have, but because I trusted him, I didn't. Now, that was in 01. I found out about this in October of 04, when it had been announced on the Birmingham TV stations that I had been indicted for selling a fellow in a handgun. So I went to see an attorney the very next week, which was on Monday, up here in town in Gadsden, and he recommended a guy in Birmingham that at one time was a federal prosecutor, and he said he could help me more than uh, since he had been on both sides of the situation there, a prosecutor and a defendant, or one that uh, would defend the client. So I contacted him, or the attorney here contacted him, and I went to see him, and when I got over there, he had the charges. I still, at that time, hadn't gotten anything from the federal court. But when I went in, he had a copy of it. And he said, Mr. Wesson said, you've never had a criminal record before in your life. I said, yes, sir, that's right. And he said, you'll probably get probation, house arrest, or community service. That's what the attorney told me the first time I was over there. And so we went to court. Few, few days after that, and they had a bunch of stuff down, the prosecutor had down, that uh, the judge threw out and went back to court, and I pled guilty, but they had charged me with a fully automatic gun, or as it's, they said, a, a machine gun, and I never had either one of them in my life. Right? Anyway, I pled guilty to selling a 380 handgun, 
to that, but I denied the, before the judge that it was not fully automatic, which it wasn't. But nonetheless, when I went back on, it's easy to remember that day because I was 72 two days before that. That was July the 26th in uh, 05. And uh, went back before the judge, and I never thought that I would go to prison. Uh, I thought they would find me or put me on probation or something uh, because I never had a record like that, any, any kind of criminal record before. But we got to court that day, and the federal judge uh, attorney got up and spoke, and the federal judge uh, made, went over some different laws and rules. And in fact, she made the statement. She said, Mr. Weston, you know, I can, I can sentence you according to the guidelines, above the guidelines, or below the guidelines. I said, yes, ma'am, I understood that. And, and so I sat down. And she said uh, something else. I don't call, I got all this on the transcript at the house right now. And, and she said something else. And I said, I stood back up and I said, let me say one thing before the sentence here. Uh, it never dawned on me she was going to give me a prison sentence. But I said, everything I've told you has been the truth. And I said, the tapes and the transcripts will bear that out. And she said, Mr. Wesson, said, you're 72 years old. Like I said, I've been 72 day, two days before that. I said, you never had a criminal record before in your life, but you shouldn't have sold that machine gun. Therefore, I sentenced you to 51 months in prison. Wow. And she gave me until that was July the 26th of 05. She gave me until October the 12th uh, to turn myself in at the Talladega prison down here. And I was thankful that I was going to be at Talladega anyway, since right. that's I'll very be, local for us. Yeah, so. yeah and uh, my wife and my daughter, one of them, and my son-in-law, brother-in-law rather, took me down there, and I went into prison earlier than I was supposed to because I told we sat out there in the van for a while, and I told them I said I'm going to go on in and get this started and get it over with and get back home, and I told them to take care of themselves. And, of course, they were all crying, and I went to the little office there before you go in, before you go in the main prison up on the hill at Talladega, and they opened the gate, and they escorted me on up to the prison. And when I got to the main prison there, they fingerprinted me and took a mug shot, and about 15 minutes after that, I didn't know whether I'd be in a cell or what. I was hoping I wouldn't, but I didn't know, because then nobody had told me. And there was a guy by the name of Mr. Dunn, who was uh, an officer at the camp, and he came up there, and he said, uh, are we going to put him in up here, or are you going to take him to the camp? Mr. Dunn said, we're going to take him to the camp. So Mr. Dunn and I walked probably 150, 200 yards to the camp down there, and I went in the camp, which was four dorms in that camp. It had a fence around it. It wasn't a very good fence, but it had a fence around it anyway, and uh, he carried me to one of the dorms. There were four dorms and approximately 100 men in each dorm. And so that's how I got into prison. And it was my fault. And I admitted that. In fact, when I heard about that on, on a Saturday morning from a friend of mine at Jack's over here at Southside, we'd go over there and drink coffee at that time. A bunch of us would on Saturday morning. He asked me about that. And I didn't know anything about it. He said, well, it was on TV last night. And so... That was on Saturday, like I said. I preached at Saks at that time, and I preached there for seven years. And so I told Margie, you know why? I said, I'm going to resign tomorrow when we go to church. And she said, why are you going to resign? And this is what I told her. I said, well, if I don't resign, and they find out that I'm affiliated with the Saks Church of Christ, there'll be a black mark on the church. And so the next morning, when we went to church service before Bible study, I told them in the auditorium, I said, I need to talk to you here before the classes all get started. And I told them what I heard. Of course, one of the brethren that was sitting there, he had seen it on TV too. And I didn't see it, but he had seen it. Like two other Albert Lewis called me, and then Tom Wortham called me. Right. The next day or two, they had seen it on TV, even though I had never seen it. I did see the article in the paper several days after that. But anyway, I said, <clears throat> I need to resign from the church here 
because I said, I've broken man's law, and therefore I've broken God's law, and I've sinned, and I need to be forgiven. And there was some of the women in the back, tears rolling down their cheek, and the men said, no, don't do that, it may not be true. And I said, well, evidently it's true because they wouldn't have it on TV, I don't think, even though I didn't have the paperwork at that time. Right. And nonetheless, I asked Donald again if he would he lead prayer in my behalf, and he did. He came up front. He led prayer, and this is what he said. And I don't say this to put my own on, but he said it's good to know that there are some people that think more of the church than they do themselves. Amen to that. And so he led prayer for me, and I didn't preach there nor teach there anymore after that day. Now, Marge and I attended there for several weeks after that. But uh, eventually, when it got close to time for me to turn myself in, we started going to Glencoe. Right. But while I was in prison, I did have a lot of opportunities. And I'm thankful to God that I did, and I'm thankful to God also that I wasn't locked up in a cell, which I never was locked up in a cell. And you had free access in the dorm, and certain times, well, after after about nine o'clock, you weren't supposed to go outside. The gates were open, or you could, I mean, you weren't locked in the dorm, but you could go outside, but there were gates. You could walk around out there. You weren't supposed to, which I never did, but some of the people did. But I had a lot of freedom. And the very first night, or the second night I was there, there was a man by the, well, he was from Coleman, Alabama. He was in prison. And they had a Bible study out in the chapel. And this group from Talladega was out there. They were Gideons. And uh, they taught they were Baptists. And he asked me, he said, do you want to go to Bible study? And I did. I went with him. And I, I went to every Bible study I could around there. Of course, I was a thorn in some of them's side when I asked them questions. But nonetheless, I did. But there were all kind of religious uh, teaching going on there from different groups but not the first one from the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ. And so one night, probably after I'd been there two or three months, the guys that, when I was in that dorm, they they knew all about me, some of them did, because they asked me the day I got out on the yard, after they gave me my clothing and stuff, and I walked out on the yard amongst others, and they said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. And I said, I preach, but I did wrong through ignorance. Well, through trusting, really. And so they would come to me and ask questions in, in the dorm. We had a little room. They called it the cube. It had, I was in there with another guy, and they had uh, a locker for each one of us. And they had a bunk, one on top of the other. And then they had a, a, a desk and a chair. And you could sit down and write things. But a lot of times at night, maybe two or three weeks after that, people started coming to the dorm asking me Bible questions. And so I asked some of them one day, I said, what about just teaching a class out there in the chapel? And I did, I started one on Tuesday night. And it wasn't too long after that, maybe six months after I was in prison, I noticed they did. They just had a service on Sunday morning at one o'clock, about one to two, or Sunday afternoon from one to two. And they didn't have a service at night, so I asked some of them around there, I said, what about me holding a service out there in the chapel on Sunday night? They didn't object to it, so we started a service out there on Sunday night. And I had a blackboard out there, and mainly when I started teaching and preaching, I, I just preached things that I knew the denominational world didn't believe about the church or the kingdom or whatever, you know, church and the kingdom are the same and different things, and I put a blackboard, I had a blackboard in there, and I, I told the people the first time I spoke out there, I said, I'm going to say some things tonight that you people aren't used to hearing, because I knew none of them were Christians, right. and, uh, and so I did, and I said, I'm going to give you book, chapter, and verse for what I say, and I did, and I said, when we get through, which it was about 30 or 40 minutes, I said, if you have any questions, you know, just ask me and I'll give you a Bible answer. And some of them did, most of them didn't, but that went on for until the time they shipped me to Butner, North Carolina. Right. Okay, so one of the things I'm pointing out immediately right here, uh, 
uh, to reemphasize at least, and I didn't mention it earlier on purpose, he's a member of the Church of Christ. He's a gospel preacher, has been for decades, six to sixties or before. Yeah. Uh, I think you were in the first graduating class of the Memphis School of Preaching. Second. Second one. Okay, missed that a little bit, but early on in the Memphis School of Preaching, so we share that in common, uh, both having attended there. And so uh, we're talking about a class act. We're talking about a man who has for decades uh, tried to fight the good fight of faith, tried to live for the Lord, and then in spite of such a, you know, a different, special, and difficult situation, has found a way already, you've heard this in the story, has found a way already to try to affect others and to draw them to Christ and ultimately to bring them into the church. And so uh, the opportunities were there at Talladega. Now you're about to move on to North Carolina. Is this where it really seems to well, get, get better as far as opportunity? Uh, yeah, and one way it was because there were more baptized there. There were three baptized at uh, Talladega while I was there. And the chaplains, I must say this, the chaplains in both places will not help you if you're a member of the Church of Christ. Okay. They kept saying that when these people wanted to be baptized, they had a portable baptistry up on the hill at the main prison at Talladega. The chaplains kept saying that we'll bring it down there. Well, that went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and they never did. So two other guys and I, one one uh, afternoon late after the commissary closed at between dinner and, and between uh, time to get up and the next morning, about dusky dark anyway, we went out there to the commissary and they had a big old portable uh, place out there that had wheels on it where they put their boxes. And so we took all the boxes out of that container and we washed it out at the back there with a hose and then though we baptized those three people in that big old uh, container out there one night. Basically in a trash can. That's what it was. <laughs> Portable trash can with wheels on it. And you won't believe what one of the chaplains, and he was a white chaplain, there was a white chaplain and a white chaplain there. But the next day or two, the white chaplain, as I was going into Chow all over there that day, and he said, Mr. Wesson, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, don't you ever do that again. You'll be in deep trouble here. That's what he told me. Don't, don't baptize nobody else here. Because we've been trying to get them to move the baptistry down or portable baptistry for a long time, several weeks anyway. But they won't have to get on. But I was threatened because we baptized three people out there. Right. And... Uh, of course, they had a medical facility. The camp was kind of like a little city within a city. And uh, when I first went down there, they, I was taking three capsules once a day. And after about three weeks, they run all kind of tests on you down there. And they put me on seven or eight different pills that I wasn't taking any of before. And they took me off the three that I'd been given by the doctor up here in town. Well, it wasn't long after that till I started passing out. The first time I passed out, I passed out on the yard out there in the back one afternoon. I felt myself, I, I felt myself getting weak. And before I could sit down, I remember falling, but I don't remember hitting the ground. But I woke up in just a short period of time, and when I woke up, there was a crowd of men standing around me. I could just see their feet. There was a wheelchair over there. They had already gone and got the wheelchair. And they thought I had a heart attack. And they took me to the commissary down there and they gave me two uh, pills for the heart. Uh, and of course it didn't phase it. And I was hurting like I don't know what because I had four ribs that were broken and the sternum was broke when I hit the ground. Mm. They sent me to the Anderson Hospital. They said I had to have a pacemaker. Make it short, they sent me to UAB and they put a pacemaker in. Well, when I got back several days after that to the camp, and I didn't have to do anything, uh, when I got back, I had a little job cleaning the inside of the dorm before I left. But uh, when I got back, I kept passing out about every week or two. And I fell out three or four more times, broke my, dropped a hole in my head up here, and broke my glasses I had on the, the second time. Mm -hmm. And after about the third, Time, I told the lady at the 
Hispanic. She was a Hispanic a PA there at the medical facility. I said, ma'am, I think it's this medicine that you're giving me is causing me to pass out because I said, I never had that problem before. She, this, this was her answer. She said, well, it could be, but she didn't change a thing. I fell out one more time and she told me, she said, we're going to send you to the best medical facility that the federal government has in Butner, North Carolina. And uh, so after about maybe six weeks, they sent me up there, which was a blessing to me. So that's what got you moved to North Carolina. It wasn't just a general prison swap, it was for no, medical attention. That's okay. it. And they did have a, they had an eight-story hospital on the, on the grounds there at Butner, North Carolina. And it was an entirely di different atmosphere. And uh, the food was much better. I lost 18 pounds in about two weeks in Iowa, Tallahassee, because the food stunk. I hate to say that, but it did. And uh, but anyway, it was much better. But what kept me going, as I mentioned to you earlier, was my faith in God and His Word in my family and my friends. A guy told me one day. He said, "You get more mail than anybody I've ever seen because the churches around would write." every week. In fact, I had one lady from Glenville, Beth McMahon, she wrote a letter to me every week that I was up there, Talladega, up there, and others did, not every week, but right. quite often. And my family stuck, stuck by me and made it a hard on my wife because she had access and it was easy to go to Talladega on Friday night and Saturday and She'd stay down there, come down on Sunday morning after worship, and she'd go back because the visitation was over at 5 o'clock. She'd go back and worship up here in town at, at, uh, at night. But when we moved, they moved me to Butner, North Carolina, it was uh, entirely different. But she still came up every five to six weeks. Right. And she would, uh, she would come up on Friday. She'd leave home, she told me, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. It, my daughter, or my, some of them would go with her all the time, but she drove up. And uh, she would spend the night up there. They would be there all day uh, Friday. They drove up on Thursday night, rather. And, and they would be there Friday, and they would be there Saturday, and they would leave usually about lunch on Sunday to come back. You know, sometimes, if it, the only good thing about the federal prison system, if it's a federal holiday, you can have visits that day. Oh, okay. And so one when, of those fall on Monday. That's yeah. right. And so when it happened like that, she would spend another night up there and come see me on Monday and then go back home. But it was a handicap to her. But I love her and I appreciate her and my family and my friends. And, and uh, she stood, stood by me. I never doubted, Jim, when I entered the prison at Tow Liquor. I never doubted that I'd come out of that prison because I believed that God had something else for me to do. Right. I really believed that. And I had faith in God and His Word and people that encouraged me. And since I got out four years, a little over four years ago, I've had some church members that asked me, said, how have people treated you since you got out? I said, everyone that's ever talked to me has been just as nice now as they were before I went in. I'm thankful for that. Well, I hadn't heard you say that, but that's one of the things that I have from a distance noted is that you would assume, it's sad to assume, but if a preacher gets sent off to prison, and by the way, I think uh, uh, your sentence was based on the fact that you were a preacher, maybe. <laughs> you know, that helped motivate people to make a show of him. But anyway, that's my opinion and only mine. But uh, you would assume that once a preacher goes off to prison, he comes back and he's lost his effectiveness, he's lost his influence, his example, his ability. And I have not seen that in you whatsoever. Uh, everybody that I've known, that you've known through the years, seems to react about you and to you the same they always did. And let me tell you where that comes from. And you know this. They're Christians. Mm, that's right. When Christians are truly Christians, they live Christ-like lives. That's right. They treat people equally. And uh, that's the respect that he gets. And so that's one of the beautiful things of all this is that uh, we do fall. We do stumble. We make mistakes. We, we sin. But if we if we repent of that and we come home, we ought to be treated just like we're back home. That's right. That's he's what, back in the pulpit now, North Gadsden Church of Christ. He's the gospel preacher here. So. He, even before I was fully released, um, I got to come home three months on house arrest after I left Butler and gone to Birmingham for the halfway house. And I stayed over there for three months. And then 
I could come home on Fridays and I had to turn myself back in over there on Sunday afternoon at five o'clock. And now they kept strict, uh, watched you very closely, which they should have. But what I'm saying is, uh, even a lot of times after I came home, they would call me at one o'clock in the morning, make sure I was there, I was on house arrest. But now I asked them about going to church service, and they said you can go to one service a week. You can't be gone over about two hours. So I couldn't go to Bible study, I couldn't go to worship. Right. Well, I preached at Glencoe a time or two, I preached at Saks, and I think I spoke up at the Falls at the congregation up there, but I, I just have to, I just have to be up there in time for worship service and speak and leave. But I'd have to call them that number in Birmingham to the halfway house and tell them where I was going, what time it was. And I'd have to call them when I got to the church building or wherever I was going. And when church service was over, I'd have to call them and tell them I, I was leaving. And when I got home, I had to tell them I was home. Now they, they really were strict about that. And I always obeyed them, and, uh, but I could not go to but one service a week. But what I'm saying is even during that time before I was fully released, the congregations around here, those that I can remember, those that I mentioned in the Sachs congregation, I spoke at those congregations while I was still under their custody. They respected you enough and trusted you enough to, to get back in the pulpit and do what you needed to be doing. So. And I admit, like I said to start with, I did a foolish thing. I should have... Uh, Checked him out, used a background check. All I had to do was call and tell him, I'll get a telephone. I had the number to call. But since I trusted this guy, I didn't do that. And I made a foolish mistake, and that's what I told the judge. And, and uh, I repented of that. And we all have our problems. We're all human. And I think about what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.12. And he talks about all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And most of the time, it's what we bring on ourselves. Now, sometimes we may be persecuted from others, but nonetheless, right. my situation is what I brought on myself and my family and my friends. But, you know, I got to thinking about something, uh, in fact, I read in, in a sermon book many years ago. And it said, you know, when we have problems, we can make a mess out of life, or we can make a message out of life. Sure. And uh, we can either be better, or we can be bitter. And this preacher went on to say, which is a well-known gospel preacher, and I heard him preach on several occasions. He said in his book, said life is kind of like a grindstone. Said it'll grind you down or polish you up, depending on what you're made of. That's right. And I thought about that a lot while I was in prison, and I made up my mind I was going to do the best that I could to live the Christian life and teach those that I came in contact with. And as a result, there were three, as I mentioned, that were baptized in Talladega in a trash can. And there were 11 that were baptized in North Carolina. While I was up there, they were baptized up at the hospital. They had a portable baptistry up there. And I did have the opportunities, and I'm thankful that I did. I never thought for years before I went into prison, I taught them. Bible class up here in the Eddie Wolf County Jail to inmates. And while I was up there, I never thought one day I'd be in prison right. myself. I have tried to get back up there. I've talked to some of the people up there about going back up there. But since I'm a felon, they won't allow me to go back up there and teach class. And right. I think that's ridiculous, but that's what I was told. Words. Well, it, you know, you never know providentially. It's almost as if your time teaching there years before prepared you more for interacting with these folks once you became a them, you know, so I just appreciate the opportunities, the open doors, apparently providentially they're open, we're open to you, whether it be in Talladega, North Carolina, like we say, these the three souls, these 11 souls are uh, saved, you know, because of this, and hopefully living the Christian life faithfully, that's what we pray in any way, and, and I know you've been able to keep in contact with a few of those, and so that's been encouraging. Uh, I appreciate the fact that the, the church is locally, have taken him back in, allowed him to preach, because ultimately we're here to save souls, he and I both, and I pray every Christian wants to do that. But uh, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, we're about out of time, and I do want to bring this up. Of course, prison life it can be difficult, and, and the way that you were put in was somewhat of a shock. I mean, you go to eat breakfast and find out you're about to go to prison, and that's a shock for you. But uh, while you were there, 
if I remember correctly, you lost two people, especially very, very dear to you. And, and uh, uh, tell us something about who that was and how you were able to make it through that time. I know that had to be probably the most dark, the darkest days you had. Yeah, you know, my oldest daughter, Joanne, she had lupus for probably 10, 15 years prior to that. And while I was up in North Carolina, she passed, passed away. And of course, my wife had called the chaplain up there but she called the wrong chaplain. But uh, I was in the camp. She called one over in the medium with a low one. And like I told you before, I had 300 minutes that I could call home uh, a, week, a month. And uh, of course, we paid for it cost $69 a month for the telephone service. But uh, nonetheless, I called home every night. And had I not called home and Margie, and when I called home and she answered the phone, she said, did you, the chaplain talk to you? I said, no, he didn't talk to me. Well, we called up there and told him to tell you that Joanne passed away. Well, it was about three days later before, like I said, she had contacted the wrong chaplain. But it was about three days later before he told me that. And had I called, not called home, I would have known. And during that period of time, too, later on, my mother passed away. She was about 93. And of course, they wouldn't let me come home. The Glencoe congregation had told me, or told Margie, that uh, they would pay my weight if they would uh, let me come home. They would fly me here, fly me back. But there was so much red tape, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do that. But I did, I lost both of them. And I thank my wife, especially. And I know I hurt her greatly, as the rest of my family. But she stood by me. I saw some people while I was in prison, even at Talladega. They were sorely concerned about their wife leaving them, and they didn't have as much sentence as I did. Right. But I never wondered about my wife because I knew she would be there. Right. She and I have been married 61 years last June, June the 13th. I mentioned I got gas in my car this morning, and I mentioned to the lady, well, another lady, I said, uh, I said, be careful, today's Friday the 13th. And she said, yes, yeah. so that's right. But I said, when you think about it, Friday the 13th is a, a great day for me. I said, that's the day my wife and I got married. That's right, yeah. that's right. Congratulations <laughs> on that. So. But, I, you know, it was hard, but you just have to do the best you can. And the best thing you can do in prison is to keep yourself busy. And I studied a lot in the, in the chapel when I had free time. And I studied with the inmates in the room, and I taught classes, and they, there were some results from that. And a lot of people, I sowed the seed. Most people rejected it, but some did not. But I'm thankful for the opportunity. But uh, I did a stupid thing. It was my fault, but I had opportunities and privileges while I was there. Well, I want to say I just appreciate you, and we, we love you and your wife, and, of course, uh, uh, the, the things that you've shown me through the years, the example and such, has been great. Of course, I know the church has been good to you. And so I just, I'm glad that that is the case. That's the way the Lord's people are. Uh, but uh, anyway, at any rate, I appreciate you and your courage for doing this. It's not the highlight of your life, but it did become an open door for you. And I appreciate you sharing this with us. But if anybody out there has any questions uh, concerning his life and, and the way that he has uh, had these opportunities, these open doors for him, that's what they turn out to be. Uh, we would encourage you to get a hold to us. I'm going to have some email addresses and such at the bottom of the screen, and you'll be able to get a hold of me, and I'll essentially put you in touch with him. And one of the things he would be overjoyed to do is that if you have a friend, a family member, an acquaintance, someone who's been put into the prison system, and they're trying to live a life uh, for Christ especially, and they're struggling in that, he can definitely help. He can either help to bring them to Christ, Lord willing. He doesn't mind writing, phone calls, whatever. Uh, but at the same time, if they're already members of the church, they're already Christians, then we definitely want to help them. There are some resources available uh, that we can get to them and help them in their way, and so we want to do that if we could. But just please get in contact with me at the email address at the bottom of the screen. I'll be more than happy to do what I can to put you in touch with Brother Wesson, and uh, we'll ultimately uh, do what we can for the cause of Christ. Again, this has been your Friday's Fighters, and I pray that you've been encouraged.